Welcome everyone to the NACUI's on-demand learning session, Navigating a Person-Centered Team Approach to Chronic Disease Management. My name is Liz Best, and I'm a Manager of Technical Assistance in the Technical Assistance and Research Center, better known as TARC at NACUI. I am thrilled today to have with me Vanessa Alvarez, Cynthia Gornu, and Chandine Begay, all from the American Indian Health Service of Chicago. Next slide, please. If you are not familiar with NACUI, the National Council of Urban Indian Health, otherwise known as NACUI, is the national nonprofit organization devoted to the support and development of quality, accessible, and culturally competent health and public health services for American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban areas. NACUI is the only national representative of the 41 Title V urban Indian organizations under the Indian Health Services and the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. NACUI strives to improve the health of over 70% of the American Indian Alaska Native population that lives in urban areas supported by quality health care centers. Next slide, please. We are so pleased that you could join us today. Please note that today's session is part of a three-part on-demand community of learning series focused on person-centered care. If you have not done so already, we encourage you to watch our two additional sessions, Engaging Your Workforce to Improve Health Outcomes Through Person-Centered Care and Health Literacy, an Essential Component of Communication Strategy for Person-Centered Care. Lastly, we ask that you please complete the evaluation provided at the end of your time with us. This will help us shape future programming. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our session speakers. Take it away. Next, Next slide. slide, please. So our main objectives for this web series, or this presentation, I should say, is one, to understand how digital health technologies such as EHR can help improve medical practice management and increase patient health outcomes by increasing practice efficiencies and cost savings. Number two, discuss opportunities for frontline workers to navigate culturally relevant aspects of chronic disease management. Lastly, create quality coordination of care interventions that help the patient and referral staff schedule and close out clinic services. And I'm gonna give this to Cynthia. Hi, yes, I'm Cynthia, pharmacy diabetes educator at American Indian Health Service of Chicago. And I just wanted to give a brief overview of our population. Um, we are the only urban Indian organization located within the state of Illinois and currently Per the U.S. Census for 2020, there are 180,000 Native American um, alone and in combination with other races located within the state where 56,000 live within Cook County, and that's where we're located. Um, our Chicagoland urban American Indian Alaska Native community has been damaged by historical and intergenerational trauma. The experiences from removal, relocation, and forced assimilation have just in the past two generations resulted in major diet changes, an epidemic of obesity, and a complete reversal in food security with a massive decline in human capital as measured by intergenerational health-related knowledges, skills, and abilities. Uh, a 2000 report by the Urban Indian Health Commission concluded that our population is among the worst of any ethnic minority in the country. Per the Office of Minority Health, the leading diseases and causes of death among our population are heart disease, cancer, unintentional injuries, diabetes, and stroke. Furthermore, systemic discrimination and exclusion of our peoples have created a socioeconomic environment of poverty, unemployment, lack of access to education and health care, and decreased health literacy all of which contribute to the health inequities that prove difficult for our population to overcome today. So now that we face behavioral health disparities that have led to creation of the creation of learned behaviors of abuse, unhealthy coping mechanisms and alcohol and substance abuse and increased suicide ideation, um, in our population, 27% of elders are diagnosed with anxiety and depression and lack the cultural protective factors that have kept our ancestors resilient for time immemorial. immemorial. So our goal is to incorporate our positive ancestral cultural ways 
within our integrated care here at American Indian Health Service of Chicago. Next slide, please. And so in terms of how electronic health records will assist in the integration of our uh, mission, um, we're gonna discuss that further on along, but in general, as the definition, HR is a electronic record of health related information and individual across more than one healthcare organization. It supports efficient, high quality, integrated healthcare, independent of the place and time of healthcare delivery, which in a way will assist with the health disparities that the Native population experiences. Next slide, please. So some of the benefits of electronic health records um, in patient-centered care, it improves better quality of care, communication, and safety between patients, healthcare providers, um, which then ultimately leads to improved health outcomes. Um, it allows for surveillance and monitoring of disease conditions, um, which will then be enhanced. There's a connection of systems and registries, um, allows for integrated health uh, services, as well as patient access to adult to their own health records, which will then enable them to make informed decisions about their health care and improve data integrity. I just wanted to expand on the improved data. So utilizing the EHR helps in many ways by increasing data collection um, for accurate charting. So CPT codes can capture reimbursements and also decrease insurance denial. So that, that also helps but also it improves the collection of aggregated data. So we can report, have accurate reports for federal, state, and city grants. Um, and that includes SDPI and GIPRA measures. So it also reflects how well we're doing in our practice as far as integrated care. Right, and that's really good because, you know, we have the microscopic more um, external view and then in the mic, macro versus micro, I'm sorry. So the microscopic view would be like more day-to-day -day activity. So reviewing the patient's charts, looking at their detailed medical records to um, see if they have any patient allergies, any uh, previous medical conditions that need to be uh, assessed or in medication adjustments. So move, uh, next slide, please. Um, continue of a, uh, continuation of the benefits of EHR. So it impl implements a checking system that alerts a clinician if any order they are entering could cause a problem, has a notification system that immediately alerts clinicians to significant events, and incorporates visual posting systems that alerts healthcare providers to issue um, to issues including crisis notes, adverse reactions, and advanced directives. Um, Another thing is it features a clinical reminder system that alerts providers of needed examinations, uh, immunizations, patient education, laboratory tests. This is important because uh, due to the standardization of medical care, we follow guidelines, and this is one way for uh, clinicians to be aware of what needs to be completed in terms of the practice. Furthermore, it allows for remote viewing of patient medical histories at all facilities that have HR and the uh, integration of the register, patient registry. So within our facility, it would, um, it links our behavioral health clinic with our medical clinic. And just for an example, when Vanessa orders a medication, I'm a pharmacist, so I make sure that medication reconciliation is perform performed for all of our patients regarding medications that are prescribed on the medical side by the primary care provider and on the behavioral health side by the psychiatrist in-house. I also ensure that all specialist medications and post-discharge hospital medications are included to provide safe care. So for example, with if Vanessa was to prescribe a new medication, we would get it and she would get an alert for a contraindication or a therapeutic drug interaction. Um, or a suicide form notification, and also public health events regarding COVID cases or flu cases within our local area. Next slide. 
So in terms of cost savings of EHR, um, so it can cut costs across our healthcare practice in both the short and long term. So some short term cost benefits include reduction of employee time spent on filing, retrieving and organizing physical charts and documents. Um, reduce the amount of physical space used to store filing cabinets and other storage areas uh, for papers, um, and as well as time saved with information exchange between medical professionals and insurance companies. So, and Cynthia? Um, and then for long-term cost benefits, significantly reduce risk of data breach and HIPAA violations, which is um, great for risk management. Transferring large amounts of data is simpler and faster. So that includes an automatic upload and sharing of our aggregated data from the EHR to the National Data Warehouse, which is done quarterly, which reports the measures for our SDPI and our GIPRA to ensure we're following best practices. Um, less physical paper is needed easier to adopt new regulations in the future with the technology, technologically appropriate system and handwritten charts can be difficult to comprehend for healthcare providers, making EHR more efficient for future users. So just as a pharmacist, like I'm used to having to read a provider's writing, which can cause increased errors and adverse incidents. So that also helps with quality care. Next, Next slide, slide, please. So some challenges of EHR, um, so the burdensome that comes to charting on all patients, um, that could be very, very time consuming for us, um, for a provider. Um, it, the EHRs demand a substantial amount of time for clerical type data entry, which is much needed to do our measures. Um, and sometimes working in EHRs, uh, we spend less time on communication and one-on-one -on -one, uh, valuable time with our patient because we need to input data. So this in a way can also decrease job, jobs satisfaction, cause some stress and decrease quality of patient care. Um, whether the use of EHRs improves efficiency for, uh, for cl uh, clinicians, um, it, it is still regarded as controversial at this point in time. Um, there's also lack of interoperability. Um, so in regards to this, I think the largest problems would be the disparate systems. There's multiple EHR systems um, in the United States. So sometimes there's no integration uh, or there's lack of communication between the different systems. So there might be a hiccup in one end. We won't be able to see some information regarding a patient's status, admission, discharge from hospital. So sometimes that's that can be a challenge. The costs, um, so it can be really, really expensive to implement EHRs in uh, small clinical healthcare settings. And then the training and technical support, you need very, very well-trained experience, uh, IT support to implement this. And if we don't have that, it can be um, difficult to transition into EHR. And then lack of integrated interprofessional templates. So I think this is one thing when we're trying to create a medical home or in the integration of BH and medicine together, um, we don't have templates that is streamlined that both BH and medical can see in regards to a patient's condition. So if we're not able to see that, it's it's difficult for us to communicate amongst our team members in terms of what's happening um, with this patient on a case by case basis. Next slide, please. And now to discuss culturally relevant aspects of chronic disease management. So at AIHSC, we use culturally tailored inter interventions for our community to prevent and control chronic diseases and mental health through imparting increased health education, management of emotional conflicts, and adherence to targeted be health behaviors, behaviors, all of which aid in our integrated care approach. Reconnection with indigenous teachings and practices increases self-esteem for our patients, decreases depression and anxiety, 
and helps our community regain a sense of belonging and social connection. Um, one, we understand that the community, our community is our biggest stakeholder. So what we do is to get the voice of the community, we perform community needs assessments at our various um, powwows. So we have an Every Child Matters powwow, an MMMIW powwow, and this month we'll have a traditional Cree round dance. And with the community needs assessments that were distributed, the community stated that they wanted to learn increased cultural teachings, um, such as beating, drumming, singing, regalia making. So it's very important to have the community voice their needs so we can tailor to what will best help them, therefore increasing positive patient outcomes. Next, um, Shandy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Shandine. So I'm a behavioral health counselor, but also the intake coordinator here with AIHSC. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the behavioral health aspect and how we incorporate our cultural perspective into our interventions. Um, so beginning with, so as Cynthia was mentioning, we do have some cultural um, events that we host, which is the powwows, the round dance. Um, and at every powwow round dance, we do offer um, readily available the four sacred medicines, um, which is cedar, sweetgrass, tobacco, or white sage. Um, and then in addition, we'll also offer cedar tea and sage tea, and this really promotes the healing, um, the healing component that we have, or the reason why we have these events. Um, so going into talking about some of the programs that we have within our um, behavior health department, um, I want to go back to the first point that's listed on the slide, which is indicating that our behavior health treatment is really patient-centered. Um, and we also ensure that all of our staff members in behavior health are trained as far as in trauma-informed care. Um, and that they have that understanding that the patient has the right to have a say-so in their treatment. Um, and so with going into the programs, um, we have three different programs that we are offering all within our behavior health department. Um, each program along with our cultural events are all tailored to bring awareness, but also to help bring an understanding and provide that safe space for our community and patients to understand the detrimental impact of colonization and intergenerational trauma. Um, and so in order to do that, um, we also provide the safe space of um, the safe space for our community and our patients to have that time to heal, to connect with each other, um, to learn more about their cultural identity. Um, and this also helps with just restoring our kinship values as well. Um, both colonization and intergenerational trauma has really disrupted our community, families, and then e even on an individual level. And so bringing in these programs just helps allow the community to understand why, um, why there may be a disruption in behaviors as far as among their families. Um, in addition, we'll also teach our community how to honor our elders, um, also the sacredness of children, and acknowledging e each other, um, and then also our environment as our own relatives. So going into the programs, um, the first one is the Seven Sacred Branches. Um, and so the Seven Sacred Branches program really hones in on teaching the principles of character. So this is about love, respect, courage, honesty, wisdom, humility, and truth. And so through those teachings, we offer cultural classes. Um, and this could be drum making, sweat lodge teachings, and then also talking about the usage of our medicines and how we utilize that in a ceremonial purpose. Um, and then we'll also bring in discussion about utilizing the eagle feather to empower, um, to empower their self-identity. The last two programs, um, we always make sure that we have at least two staff members in our behavior health department who are trained and certified to facilitate these groups. So the first one is our Well Variety program, which, or yeah, first one is our Well Variety program, which is gonna utilize a indigenized 12-step program. Um, and it's utilizing 
a curriculum that's from White Bison. Um, and it's gonna cover the base principles on values, um, teaching, teaching the community how to have a healthy community development. And then also um, healing from alcohol, substance abuse, co-occurring disorders, and also intergenerational trauma. Our last program is going to be the Mending Broken Hearts. Um, and the Mending Broken Hearts program is a program that we will be starting. It's fairly new. Um, so our first session will be December 1st, starting providing group support to the community. Um, and this is also utilizing a curriculum from White Bison. Um, and it's going to address intergenerational trauma, healing. And so both programs will help provide that cultural aspect in preventing negative feelings and self-destructive behaviors. Next slide, please. So um, this slide is just some of the four sacred medicines. Um, so um, it just kind of talks about tobacco, sweet grass, mm -hmm. cedar, and sage. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this slide um, is a assessment of wellness. And so this is going, it's showing a visual model of how we assess the holistic wellness within our patients um, who are coming in for individual counseling. Um, and so the first one is the medicine wheel. Um, so the medicine wheel is gonna look at the mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical aspect. Um, and so if we have a patient who comes in who are indicating that they're feeling um, you know, some low motivation, um, and then we'll also look at their mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical aspect as well. Um, the second model is the assessing your life balance. So this is utilized within our alcohol and substance abuse program. Um, so our peer counselor will utilize this assessment with her patients. Um, it has so the pie chart is broken up into six different components, um, which is pretty much covering just about everything from the mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical side. Um, and so the patient will have a set of questions that is aligned with each pie chart, um, and they'll be able to answer, answer the questions and rate themselves on this pie chart. So at the end, they'll have a visual, um, a visual perspective to see where they're standing at currently. Okay, and there's just one thing I wanted mm -hmm. to add. Thank you, Shandine. Um, health and wellness is important to both indigenous and Western viewpoints. However, it is our community that believes in a holistic aspect of healing that involves physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual components. Such medicine wheel teachings as the cycles of life, stages of life, four directions, and natural elements are integral to heal and recover from historical and intergenerational trauma and subsequent health disparities. Next slide, please. So now to continue on with the culturally relevant aspects and how we incorporate this into our care. Um, the first is, again, as I mentioned from a previous slide, is that we per make sure that our four traditional sacred medicines are available at cultural events. Uh, but we also make sure that it's available during individual and group sessions. And so this is initiated from the first contact when we make um, contact with patients from the intake. Um, it is always asked if the patient would like um, a cultural perspective to be incorporated, which could be smudging. Um, and then starting off our group sessions in a good way with um, smudging as well. Um, and we'll also have in our birch basket, um, the four medicines available for patients who are coming in or leaving from their appointments to take a tobacco tie, sweet grass, um, cedar, or white sage with them. So we always ensure that we just have those readily available for our community. Thank now I'll you. pass it over to Cynthia. Thank you, Shandine. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I did want to mention is that a lot of our ancestral teachings have been lost because of forced assimilation and colonization and attendance to boarding schools where those traditions and language haven't been passed down. So one thing that we know we need to do is reclaiming these, and we want to do that within our clinical aspects of care. We're committed to incorporating and providing care management through an indigenizing treatment approaches for all aspects of healthcare. Within the past year, we have been incorporating ancestral ways of knowing for 
chronic disease management. Um, such activities have included a presentation about the four sacred medicines and also the cultural significance of tobacco as being sacred versus commercial use. And this has helped us implement a tobacco cessation clinic. Um, we also had a medicinal tea presentation for our seniors at an elder luncheon, and they were able to try various medicinal teas. They received planters with chamomile and catnip seeds, and they learned how these teas can be used to alleviate stress and anxiety the way that our ancestors used to use teas. What's, what's really cool is that the learning session, um, the learning session, it actually increased conversation amongst our elders regarding their memories as children and how they went with their aunts or their grandparents to gather medicinal um, foods and traditional foods. And it allowed them to, to share that with their others and with their and we encourage that to share with also um, the grandchildren. These cultural interventions provide a holistic approach in restoring an individual's well being through harmony and balance, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Um, next slide, please. So, as we mentioned um, in our earlier slides and all the different programs that our uh, facility has um, developed, it's really important that we coordinate all our different programs and care services uh, to help improve patient care and outcomes. So one way to do this is to actually create a um, position, we call it the referral coordinator, uh, primarily working with BH as well as medical to help uh, refer patients if there is higher level of needs um, that needs to be, like I said, referred out to a different facility. So this includes um, detox program, like detox facilities, or if they need to see, like from the medical perspective, different special specialists as cardiologists, neurologists that we don't have here in our primary care facility. So it's really, really important that we have this person on board. Another thing that's important about this um, position is that they, this person, um, creates linkage agreements to different facilities. So we have, we're building a referral program in a way where we know that our patients, our native population will be able to get patient-centered care that will also recognize their native heritage and try to coordinate as well with that. Um, Cynthia? Oh, so just furthermore, we've also instituted monthly integrated care meetings where representatives from the clinical side and the behavioral health side, we come together and we talk about high risk patients. Mm -hmm. And so we each have different aspects to share as far as how the patient is doing. And we understand that a lot of our, our patients with comorbid, com comorbidities have behavioral health issues mm -hmm. because of trauma. Mm -hmm. So this allows us to share and to plan the best ways to help our patients increase um, increase their quality of care. Um, we also do a monthly diabetes meeting where we meet to also talk about the best ways to incorporate the newer medications. And um, Vanessa and I have done really well in getting our patients controlled where most of them have been measuring under 7% for their A1C within the past since October of last year. Um, and then, thank you, Cynthia. Yep. And then another thing um, that we uh, utilize to help uh, coordinate care would be the mic our Microsoft team. So um, for example, when I have a patient who comes in, whether it's just like an annual well women or well, you know, annual wellness exam, we do screen them for anxiety, depression, and if they do flag for that, then I will be on my computer with the teams, and then I would shoot Shandine a message, hey, I have a patient I think would benefit from behavioral health. Um, would you have time to come and just get introduced to this patient and kind of just chat with them and see where they're at? So that comes with our warm handoffs, which is really, really important. Um, to help 
get them on board as far as like if they do need behavioral health, uh, mental health counseling. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the warm handoffs are really great uh, because it allows us to also work on destigmatizing mental health. Um, and just providing that space for patients to ask questions, um, to get some reassurance, but also to really empower patients that, you know, it is it does take a lot to take that first initiative to ask for help. Um, and so just providing the support that we can in any way and just ensuring that we're providing that care level of good level of care um, from the very start until they're getting seen by a counselor or getting seen by the medical team. All right. And thank you, Shandine. So in conclusion, we understand the importance of maximizing our EHR capabilities as far as integrating, um, incorporating behavioral health screenings. So that can be done at every um, patient visit as well as gauging how well our integrated approach is working for our community through assessment of our measures. Um, but most importantly, we also recognize the importance of incorporating indigenous data practices to collectively heal and overcome the health inequities that our Chicagoland native population has. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you, if the audience has any further inquiries or questions in regards to this presentation or what programs we offer at our facility, facility, please contact um, our contact person, Cynthia Gurnell, pharmacist, um, and you know we'll be happy to hear and feel some questions from you. Thank you. Have a good one. Next slide, please. Thank you, Cynthia. Vanessa and Chandine for your uh, for sharing your work with us. I know it will be um, inspirational and insightful to many that are watching today. Um, and I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope to see you at a future event. Um, and if you have a moment, please take the time to fill out the following survey. As I said, this will help shape future programming uh, to serve you best. So thank you again, and everybody have a great day.